Hello, and thank you for joining us today as we kick off the Way Forward, a webcast series on disrupting dehumanization hosted by Forward Promise. Forward Promise is a national program that supports culturally responsive practices that buffer the effects of historical and systemic trauma on boys and young men of color. My name is Andrew Malinge. I will be your moderator for today. I'm a senior program manager for a tech ed nonprofit called Code Nation. And I'm also uh, a national advisory committee member for Forward Promise. For communities of color, there are two pandemics, COVID-19 and racism. The successive dehuman dehumanizing deaths of Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and George Floyd spotlight the systemic racism and racial trauma affecting people of color. Dehumanization, the persistent invalidation of humanity through both perceptions and treatment continues to threaten the healthy development of boys and young men of color and their communities. The Way Forward, a five part webcast series centers five dimensions of dehumanization as the foundation for systemic racism and racial trauma. Our panel of experts throughout the course of the series will present ways to substantively disrupt dehumanization and affirm the full humanity of boys and young men of color. In today's inaugural episode, Start at the Root, Disrupting Historical Dehumanization, we'll share solutions to impacts of historical dehumanization on Black, Brown, Southeast Asian Americans, and communities of color as a whole. The purpose of today's discussion is to position the information that we'll hear as a part of our common language and lexicon, and the solutions offered will affirm the humanity of boys and young men of color, and do so in a way that everyone that's joined us today will be able to uh, take what we've learned today and, and, and ca carry that into their own communities. So we have four um, incredible panelists that I'll introduce individually, or I'll actually have them introduce uh, themselves individually. We'll start with Dr. Rhonda Soyafat Bryant from the Ford Promise. Hi everyone, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. Um, I am Rhonda Soyafat Bryant, I am President and CEO of the Mariah Group, which is a firm that really works to change the future for children of color by focusing on strategies and research and authentic action. One of our projects is Forward Promise, which I co-direct with Dr. Howard Stevenson. And so we're really pleased to be here today um, to begin this conversation. And so thank you to everyone that is going to participate. Thank you, Dr. Bryant. Next up, we have Dr. Howard C. Stevenson of Ford Promise. Hello, everyone. Um, I am Howard Stevenson, and I'm the director of the Racial Empowerment Collaborative at the University of Pennsylvania's Graduate School of Education. And I'm so proud and happy to be a co-director with uh, Rhonda, Dr. Bryant, uh, Ford Promise. Thank you, Dr. Stevenson. Next up, we have Howard Sanchez Flores from the National Compadres Network. Good morning, everybody. My name is Hector Sanchez Flores. I serve as the executive director of the National Compadres Network. Um, we do work to uh, bring culturally rooted healing uh, to communities and remind communities of the wonderful gifts that they have that will create a progress for their healing based on their traditions. I also am the proud son of Gaudencio and Selena Sanchez, you know, who were immigrants from Mexico, and the grandson of Ildefonso Flores and Maria de la Luz Orozco de Flores, Andrea Valdez and Guadalupe Sanchez. Uh, have these two beautiful kids named Diego and Sofia and wonderful wife named Lucy. So in addition to my official role, these are the things that create balance in my life and the hope that I can do wonderful work in the community. Thank you so much, Hector. And last but not least, we have Katrina Dizan Mariategi from the Southeast Asia Resource Action Center. 
Hi, everyone, and good morning or good afternoon. Uh, really excited to be joining this panel. Um, again, my name is Katrina Dizon Marietegui. I am currently serving as the Acting Executive Director of CREC, or the Southeast Asia Resource Action Center. Uh, we are a national civil rights organization that works to empower refugee communities from Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam. And we were founded in 1979, originally to support with the resettlement of the largest group of refugees to ever resettle in the United States. Uh, similar to Hector, I too am an immigrant. I'm from the Philippines. Um, and I just love how he talked about what um, causes him to have balance in life. So I would love to uplift my beautiful four-year-old daughter, Maddie, who's about to have lunch and take a nap, I think, and my husband, Ryan. And I'm really proud and happy to be here with all of you today. Thank you so much, Katrina. And also just thank you all um, of our panelists uh, for this, this afternoon. So um, today is going to be pretty, uh, a lot of information is gonna be shared, uh, but we also wanna build this space of community. And that starts by introducing yourselves. Uh, so if you all can, wherever you are, if you're in the Zoom link or if you're in on YouTube, on Twitter or Facebook, uh, feel free to just drop in what city and state or territory you reside. And uh, just so we can kind of get a sense of who's in the room. I'm checking out on YouTube, see who's on here. I'm checking out on YouTube, see who's on here. And as we're coming up with that, how about um, our panelists just say like where you are uh, coming in from? We'll start with you, uh, Dr. Bryant. I am based here in Huntsville, Alabama. All right. And uh, Dr. Steve? Uh, yes, I'm in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Okay. And uh, Hector? I'm in uh, wonderful California in San Jose, California. I Though we're experiencing a lot of wildfires, so it's kind of gloomy out there right now. Yeah. And uh, Katrina. Uh, yes, um, I'm based out of the DC, Maryland, Virginia area. Um, our office is in downtown DC, but right now I'm working from home um, in Silver Spring, Maryland. Oh, nice. That's where I am right now. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> what a coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> I'm based in New York, though, but. We have uh, Tacoma, Washington in the house. Thank you uh, for uh, putting your location, Amanda, and uh, Seattle, Washington. Um, thank you, Brooke. And I'm sure we'll, we'll have some more folks uh, share their location where they're residing right now. Um, but this is just amazing just to see how technology can bring us together, especially during times of uh, hardship. Um, and it's, it's a, it's a great way for us to really learn about what's what's happening in each of our communities and, and how we can bridge that together and, and create solutions moving forward. We also have Philly in the house. Uh, so Dr. Stevenson, yeah, you're not alone here. Um, oh, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Okay, yeah, they're coming in, they're coming in. Thank you, Pamela. Excellent, excellent. We also have Huntsville, Alabama again. So looks like uh, we're in a three-way tie, Silver Spring. Okay, all right, well, we have Laurel, Maryland. So that's another Maryland, I'll take that. So I, I think Maryland wins this, wins this uh, <laughs> little competition. <laughs> well, uh, feel free to continue sharing where you are checking in from. Uh, we're going to get started with our first segment. Um, so thank you for um, just, participating in our polling question. We're going to have a few more of these like throughout the session. So just, uh, I'll make you, I'll let you know like when, when that's appropriate. But right now we're gonna kick off the start at the root uh, with a presentation of dehumanization framework by doctors Rhonda Soyafat Bryant and Howard C. Stevenson. The floor is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I want to start with a proverb. The lion's story will never be known as long as the hunter is the one to tell it. 
in the long history of these United States, we have never told the whole truth or reconciled how racial segregation, genocide, and exploitation of black and brown human resources in the name of white supremacy have not only contributed to the disparities in the access and quality of education, work, and housing, but most assuredly explain the gaps and disparities in health and wealth outcomes for generations of black and brown people. What we are suggesting is that the primary tool or hammer of white supremacy has been dehumanization. At the center of dehumanization is the pervasive idea that people of color do not need or are not worthy of basic human dignities. Dehumanization threatens the healthy development of boys and young men of color and their villages and manifests in the narratives, policies, and practices that impact them. The psychological tool, the policy tool, the theory tool has been dehumanization. At Forward Promise, we decided early on that if we are going to seriously address the longstanding negative and life-threatening health outcomes for boys and young men of color in the 21st century, we could not start with a focus on therapy. We could not start with a focus on nutrition. We could not do it without viewing those health outcomes through a historical lens of systemic racism and colonialism. We believed early that we could not ethically advocate for the provision of educational health and justice resources to help boys and young men of color heal, grow, and thrive without a look-see at the rot in those systems of education, health, and justice. We felt we would be at risk of what Frederick Douglass warned of, becoming those kind of folks who wanted crops without plowing up the ground. We must start at the root. So it is with racism and colonialism. At the root of this country's wealth, progress, and greatness is a false narrative, a lie, a story that is not true about the history, potential, and plight of Black, Indigenous, people of color. And the tool of that lie is dehumanization. And the consequences of that lie and the policies and practices that carry out that lie is harmful to us. Through the practices and policies of racial and colonial dehumanization, our stories and histories have been distorted. Our ways of being and of worshiping have been despised. Our communities and communications have been destroyed. Our feelings and expressions of those feelings have been denied and our bodies and the very movements of our bodies have been surveilled and assaulted. And yes, we are saying that this legacy of dehumanization affects our hearts, bodies, minds, and souls but we have something to say about that. We are here today to kick off a series of discussions about racial and colonial dehumanization that helps to explain the roots of the health challenges affecting communities of color. Now, because we start with talking about dehumanization, it does not mean that we believe in the inferiority of black and brown life, no. We are saying that in all the discussion of trauma-informed programming, Somehow we have forgotten the historical trauma of racism and colonialism. If we look uh, at what's happening today, I think you will find that our focus on these five uh, types of dehumanization will help us understand that history. I'm, I'm happy to turn it over now to Dr. Bryant to talk about those five types of dehumanization. Thanks, Howard. So at Ford Promise, we really focused on increasing people's understanding about what racialized trauma is, what dehumanization is, how it has impacted boys and young men of color, and their potential for a bright and positive future, and what are the solutions to disrupt. So the purpose of this series is really to break that down for people so that we can begin to rebuild together in new and better ways. So to do this, we felt we needed to break down dehumanization into understandable bites for people so that we could define it in a way that showed people clear examples of how dehumanization is constructed through negative narratives about people of color, how it is implemented through dangerous actions that are taken toward people of color, both in daily treatment in society and in the policies that actually govern our nation. And finally, the impact that it's had on people of color and society, both in terms of its direct harmful outcomes and also how people of color are blamed every day for their own struggles. 
And so as Howard mentioned, we break dehumanization down into five domains. The first of which is historical, which we're focusing on in today's webcast. And I have to say, you know, Howard, our grantees are doing deeply transformative work to help boys and young men of color to heal from the trauma of dehumanization and to disrupt policies that don't operate in their best interest. And so for me, our grantee partners are the living examples of how disrupting dehumanization can happen in a community every day. Mm -hmm. So since this is the first webcast in the series, I felt like we should spend some time defining the five domains of dehumanization so that people will know what we're gonna to cover today, but also where we're going for the next four episodes after this one. So the first of the domains is historical dehumanization, which is defined as the thoughts, feelings, and actions that have led to the mass destruction and punishment or control of land and people. And so in today's conversation, we're gonna spend time talking about that history from the perspective of African-Americans, Southeast Asians, and indigenous peoples. The second domain of dehumanization is cultural and spiritual dehumanization. It's defined as the thoughts, feelings, and actions that demonize, disregard, devalue, or marginalize the cultural and spiritual practices of communities of color. And as a people, we know mm -hmm that um, aspects of our culture are ignored, vilified, or monetized. Mm -hmm. But the way that we gather, the way that we celebrate, the way that we love on each other is different. And that should not be problematic. Exactly. And, and the way that um, so many times our very style has been attacked by the way we even walk and talk, right? The way that we are followed and mm -hmm. surveilled, uh, just being ourselves. And we have seen this kind of... Um, you know, um, stereotyping and profiling happening not only um, for our, our our young people, but for families, for adults as well, for folks who are elderly. It just across the lifespan, we see some fear of the other um, coming from those who somehow think our cultural ways, our cultural ways of being, our cultural ways of worshiping, uh, are somehow threatening. I don't mm -hmm. get that. And I think just even the way we enjoy each other, the way we laugh together, the way we love together um, as people um, is demonized sometimes. And we're made to feel lesser than, you know, I think about the example of um, the family trying to have a barbecue in the park and the police being called on them. You know, just because we're out trying to enjoy some music and have some fun in the way that our culture believes um, is beautiful for us. And that should yeah. not be a problem in the society that we live in. And it can happen anywhere. You can be too loud, too spiritual, too religious, too uh, rambunctious. You move around too much. There's a way in which um, for us in college, for example, we owned a table at the lunchroom. We sang at that table. We were ourselves at that table. We prayed at that table. And even that caused our peers to wonder what is going on. It's like when two or three black or brown people get together, they think uh, somehow a, ga a gang or some kind of issue is gonna start. And um, we wanna speak up against that. Absolutely. The third area of dehumanization um, is social dehumanization. And that's defined as the thoughts, feelings, or actions that divert resources or fail to invest resources in communities of color and restricts the rights of these communities in the social, educational, or legal arenas. And you know, this current COVID-19 crisis has clearly shown us some of the flaws in our social systems. And it has shown how people of color have been system, um, excuse me, <clears throat> systematically uh, denied mm -hmm. resources and restricted for many, many years. So, you know, things like the way that our temporary assistance for needy families program has operated, for example, to keep families of color ineligible. And there are endless other examples of that. Um, and I think that during this time of COVID-19, it's really uncovered some of those things, but these are the things that we have been advocating and speaking up against for decades. You know, our children are punished in the justice system, they're punished in school every day in ways that are unfair. And you know, our communities are lacking in the things that they need um, 
and basically just do the best they can with what they have because resources are intentionally diverted away from communities of color um, as a way of preventing them from thriving and growing. Absolutely. Yes, and I think that uh, just even the way we think of what social means as part of identity, that some of us define ourselves as me, myself, and I. And, and as we heard from, when I announced it, when our uh, guests announced themselves, they included family, they included community. So even the notion of how we define ourselves and our identity as communal as opposed to individual is, uh, is also considered a threat, right? And, in many respects, um, if we're going to advance in this world, must we only do it by ourselves to be thought of as successful and we want to challenge that? Right, right, yes. The fourth area is emotional dehumanization. And that's defined as the thoughts, feelings, and actions that limit expressions of empathy toward communities of color, that demonize these communities for their outcry in the face of negative experiences. And you know, when I think about emotional dehumanization, two things often come to mind. The first, um, I think a lot about when Stefan Clark was killed and his brother Stevante had a very public breakdown because of the loss of his brother and mm. how he was just treated terribly in the media and talked about and even I believe briefly incarcerated because of his emotional breakdown and nobody, um, felt like they should empathize with him in this moment when he had experienced such a tremendous loss. And then I think too about um, the racial protests that were happening this spring and people questioning why some of the protests turned violent. Yeah. And I just feel like, don't we have a right to be mad? Don't we have a right to express that anger? And don't we have a lot to be mad about? So are we supposed to keep that all bottled up for the safety and convenience of a society that doesn't care for us? Or should we express it because that we have that right? Oh, so true, Rhonda. And the way in which, um, sadly, that same dehumanization can find itself in how we are cared for when we actually have paid for resources, when we have actually paid for health care, when we actually have paid for the kinds of professional courtesies and services that every person deserves Right, even the way we manage our pain. You could, you, it's a wonderful uh, set of studies and research that look at how doctors, uh, both consciously and unconsciously, somehow think that black and brown people can handle more pain, right? Mm -hmm. On some level, that uh, that that allows them to justify the withholding of medicine, withholding of what is constitutionally or or sort of what is the reasonable set of care standards that are violated with that sort of assumption. I don't think your feeling matters as much as uh, everyone else's. Right, right. And the final area is physical dehumanization. The thoughts, feelings, and actions that place the physical bodies of members of communities of, of color at risk of harm. Um, and we started today with Andrew lifting up three of the names. Um, and there are countless um, unfortunately, um, just horrible, horrific, oh, horrific. I can't even get the words out. Like I think about it and it evokes immediate tears for me. Um, examples of how our bodies are at risk in this society. And, you know, I just stop killing us, period. Just end of discussion, just stop and recognize that we um, are human and we deserve to live. Yeah, and it, it reminds me, um, of, I have two sons, Brian and Julian, one is 29, the other's 15. And, and in a sense, how many parents of young boys uh, of color have to worry to tell their children, be careful how you move, be careful about any sudden movements. And I am in pain when I think about in Wisconsin, that what kind of threat was it that, that that man was walking away from them, that they needed to shoot him? What is it about his movement and him being him would cause that kind of threat reaction? And in a sense, um, as parents, we have reasons to worry about uh, telling our children how they should actually be and their physically sort of their physical presence uh, in the spaces they occupy. Yeah. Uh, and we should have something to say about that. Yeah. You know, last night I was sitting talking with Andrew um, 
my son about buying a car because he just got his license, mm -hmm. his, his learner's permit. And um, he was talking about what kinds of cars he wanted to drive. And it, it, I had a moment where I had to say to him, you can't buy that kind of car because you're a black boy. Yeah. Because guaranteed you're going to be stopped every time you try to drive down the street with that car. And just having to have these conversations with our children, it just tears me up because it's not fair, it you is. know, that we have to, um, we have to limit who we are because our very livelihoods, our very bodies are at risk every time we make a decision that somebody else thinks is not right. And sometimes we don't even have to be doing anything wrong. Yes. Um, yes. And I'm, I'm so glad we have colleagues now today are going to talk about what kind of medicines we can use yes. to heal that kind of trauma, that kind of dehumanization, yes. for sure. Yeah. And, you know, all of these forms of dehumanization carry messages that all people of color and the boys and young men of color that we work with at Forward Promise, you know, that, that they internalize, mm -hmm. you know, um, and they carry those messages with them. And it makes it hard sometimes to navigate life and to navigate the day. Uh, in your work with the Racial Empowerment Collaborative, how do boys talk about the weight of these messages um, and how it impacts them? Um, in so many ways, um, we've had young boys tell us um, and tell me that, you know, there's a way in which um, I might be threatened by my best friend. There's a way in which I still have not had the ties with some of the people I call my homies, who in, in a moment's notice, because of not interrogating the stereotypes or the negative histories about people who didn't look like me, I might see them as an enemy. I've had young people tell me, young boys tell me, you know, I ain't going out like no punk. As if that is the sort of only option that you have is to go out, that your best strength move, your best sense of courage or statement of courage is to not, is to go out in a particular way. And I think we think of that as an in, in sort of internalization of a narrative that's not meant for them that they are living out a story that's not their story, but it does have consequences to live in a, in a context of dehumanization. And there are researched and very specific health implications um, from the racialized trauma of dehumanization that we don't often hear about or talk about. You know, our young people are experiencing greater stress hormones in their body. They're experiencing lack of sleep. They're experiencing um, greater rates of, of obesity and weight gain. All of these things are happening to them physically. And we have evidence that shows that it is directly tied to the trauma of dehumanization. But we live in a society that does not take responsibility for that. We live in a society that does not acknowledge that for generation after generation after generation, the actions and the weight of dehumanization has impacted the very health and well being of people. Um, and we have had to fight back with our own medicines to try to be well in the face of just heavy oppression. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Absolutely. And we know a lot more now than we've ever known. Uh, thanks to more conscious research around the racial politics um, of health that um, these traumas linger, not only um, <clears throat> from our childhood to our adulthood, they linger across generations. Imagine that, right? In mm -hmm. the same way that we could pass on from our ancestors stories of resilience, um, we also are vulnerable to long-term intergenerational trauma. <clears throat> And um, I think we have something to say about that. Absolutely, absolutely. So that is where we're gonna go over the course of these five episodes with these webcasts. And I'm thankful that people are coming on the journey with us. And I'm thankful for all of the speakers that are joining us because we're gonna promote the solutions. We are, our work is to fight back. Our work is to disrupt. Our work is to cre create the society that we want to see and the society that is going to really be in the best interest of the thriving of our young people. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Andrew, our moderator, so that we can get into the next segment of our conversation.
Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Brian, Dr. Stevenson, for providing the framework for how we're thinking about um, and acting in a, in a way that um, counters dehumanization. So to expand this conversation and, and, and talk more about how it applies to uh, the historical context and the current context of dehumanization in, in various communities, we're going to um, add our panel um, to Hector and, and Katrina. Uh, they're gonna join uh, Howard uh, to continue this conversation about how dehumanization um, is playing out in today's society. Um, and, and I'll just note that in order to get to a level of talking about solutions, we need to understand, we need to be rooted in how our uh, understanding of our history uh, impacts like what is happening today and what, what's happening in the future. So without further ado, I'm going to open up the floor to um, Katrina, Hector, and, um, and Howard. <clears throat> okay, so um, I wanted to just share a little bit about some of the historical aspects for African-Americans and it will not be an exhaustive list, but when we think about uh, dehumanization, um, obviously we begin at chattel slavery, the idea that black people and um, <clears throat> African folks could be treated for over for 300 years with a sense of violence and horror um, in which um, as you look through those years of violence and, and, and genocide, um, an incredible amount of wealth was gathered in that time. And when we think about historical um, transition from slavery, um, there's the issue of lynching. There's the issue of, of convict leasing over the course of that time. There's the, the issue of what my brother Brian Stevenson talks about as an evolved form of slavery and in in what we see today as mass incarceration. And in, in all of that time, there are in many... Um, examples of, of this lynching that involved rioting, that involved sort of uh, terrorizing neighborhoods, right? This domestic terrorism, you could argue with both symbolic and uh, physical, right? And um, the threat was real every day. And so in many respects, African-Americans have not only a historical, um, a, a history of violence about their very beings, uh, their very thoughts, their very styles, their very attitude, their very uh, specific attitudes. But they've also, in the in the course of that time, lost access to wealth op opportunities. Um, that that if you if you read the book by Richard Rothstein on the history <clears throat> of the housing discrimination debacle since uh, the New Deal in in the 1930s and after uh, the, the Second World War, you have this incredible governmental uh, collusion to block legally black people from uh, work for living in neighborhoods uh, where white people would start. So suburbs were developed according to Rothstein in ways that uh, led to expansion um, in a time when both black and white folks could actually afford the housing um, at a time after the war when you could see a potential middle class of black folks growing in, 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 in comparison to white folks, um, both the, the Federal Housing Authority as well as the, uh, the VA colluded to block black people from living near white people. And that in its own way contributed to the net wealth differences that we see today, where some have estimated that <clears throat> the net wealth for for white families is 10 times that for, for white families, um, uh, for black families. And in a sense, um, the cost of enslavement, the cost of discrimination, the cost of the lack of access influences the way neighborhoods are constructed, right? So even if some of us who are researchers who have studied, well, you know, maybe it's the individual that's the problem, or maybe it's the family that's the problem, or maybe it's the neighborhood. Even if we thought going to neighborhood effects was a better way to understand what was going on with young people of color, we would forget the reality that our own neighborhoods were constructed out of discrimination. <laughs> and that discrimination led to our access to health, 
quality, access to educational quality, access uh, to a host of issues. And then when we tie it all together, you can imagine if I had a house or if my grandfather had a house in the 40s uh, or in the 50s or in the 60s, the equity from that house could have built so much wealth between the 60s and now that we would have a very different structure. We'd have a very different set of access uh, to not only healthcare, but educational and work opportunities. So I'm gonna stop there uh, at least um, as an introduction for this notion of historical discrimination has accumulated the kinds of disparities that we have seen. Um, and if you wanna explain what happened to COVID or what, how COVID happened to communities of color, uh, you need only to track these, these policies um, that started um, hundreds of years ago. Thank you, Dr. Stevenson. Um, Hector, would you like to expand? Sure. I just, you know, when we talk about the indigenous people of the Americas, and um, we oftentimes really look at the very contemporary reality of, of, of marginalization, under-resourced uh, communities, um, and we, and rightly so, right? In the United States, uh, indigenous people, Native American people of this region have been oppressed, stolen from, uh, and as one of the elders from that community once said, to, you know, standing up and declaring, you know, my physical presence today here is a reminder of the failure of the genocide, right? So his, his just being alive was a uh, the demonstration that the policy of, of, of eradicating this continent of indigenous people, um, you know, it would, did not succeed. However, you know, the, the effects of that long-term um, failed policy of genocide did not preclude people from being their land taken away, their language taken away, their, their traditions and ways of, of, of connecting to the world through spirituality marginalized and, and, and deemed to be inappropriate. But sometimes we only want to focus on what is going on and what we see here in the last uh, few hundred years, right? And as Dr. Stevenson talks about that long arc, well, in the Americas writ large, uh, you know, it was found, it, the foundation of it really started in uh, 1493. Uh, Pope, Roman Catholic Pope Alexander VI issued a papal bull, Intercaetera, which basically said that uh, Spain and Portugal had the right to colonize uh, the Americas uh, for their thrones. And as a result of that, um, the native peoples of the Americas would be subjects to the throne, right? And so we oftentimes now will think about, well, what, what effect did that have? That was a papal bull of uh, 1493. Well, Columbus landed uh, in the Caribbean and he began to you know, the term oppressed seems almost uh, egregious to say the, the kind of torturous things that happened to the Taino people and the people of that region, right? But what it set in, mm -hmm. what it set in place was the next stage of, of colonialization and conquest. And that was in February of, of 1519 when Hernan Cortes arrived uh, on, the go on the coast of Mexico. And set forth this, um, this overthrow of the civilization that was there. And we like to think of that civilization as being a historic civilization that was conquered and taken down. But, but the people of that region are alive today in spite of that conquest, right? And many of them have, have adhered beautifully to keeping their traditions, their ways of praying, their ways of being, their language, the Nahuatl languages, the many Nahuatl languages, rooted languages of the, of, of the Americas, to this day, they remind, re, remain in that survival mode. So those are the oppressive things that are, you know, kind of we read about, but some of the lesser things that, are, that were equally vital to, to that history of oppression was a system of what was called castas or castes. And in that there was a definitely false hierarchy of human value based on who you were and where you, where you came from. So the peninsulares uh, were people from the Iberian Peninsula, the Spanish, the Spaniards, if you will. They were uh, the top, 
right? Because they came here and they had the authority of the throne and they were allocated resources based on where they could be sent to basically take the land and the resources and take and take tribute from people from that region. Uh, the second level was the criollos. Um, you know, in the in the United States, we refer to them, you know, in, in the Louisiana, Louisiana region as Creoles, right? But basically, in that era at that time, it just meant you were native to that land, right? And so those were were people from that area that kind of assimilated into with the peninsulares or the Spaniards. And then came the Indios, you know, the people that we are all interconnected with, the, the Amera Indians is the term uh, that some literature calls it. But those are my people, right? That, that, those are the people that are woven into the fabric of my genetic makeup and, and my blood as well. And then finally, the, the mestizos, which is where we began to blend and mix with the, Ameri with, the, with the native people of the land of the continent and the Spanish. I share that because that is the seed of separation. That is the seed that if we don't consciously undo, it remains within us, right? Because culturally, we were not supposed to be separated. You could be within the same family with a Spanish father because those were men, only men arrived on those ships, right? And so if you can imagine what that would be like with men arriving in ships, no women, uh, and that's and 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 so we now create hierarchies in our family. Uh, these that those that came are higher because they say so, right? And they become embedded in our psyche, in our feeling, in our sense that unravels the root of what we know is the most important thing, and started with our relationship to one another, right? Mm -hmm. Our relationship to one another, and how do we really feed that? So this historic conquest that happened, that started with that papal bull and led into the colonialization of the Americas, right? We still, if we don't talk about it, that's the value of this conversation is that we then don't even realize how it's, how it's weaving through our bodies and what it is that we have to undo. And it insidiously, it makes us think that if we can within ourselves create the other, right? and dehumanize other people because they're not like me mm -hmm. or I buy into the false hierarchy of human value, right? Yeah. Then I can do that with you. And I can do it with anybody whom I do not think that I share a connection or lineage to or, or, or even welcome the creation of those relationships that do that. And mm -hmm. so I would you know, say that um, although different than when we brought people from the other continent of Africa, that we did a different kind of job of colonial conquest of our minds here, right? And so as a result of that, I think it's important for us to really openly discuss this so we can begin to unravel and create the medicine that allows us to then create connections that are rooted in the traditions that predate the conquest and the colonialism of our people here, right? And I believe that in doing that, we begin to address this in a really deep way because then I begin to see people not just in their trauma, but truly connect to people in that term that I use incessantly, the beautiful sacredness of other people, right? And when mm -hmm. I see you as sacred, then it makes it really hard for me to not learn your story, learn from your journey, connect with your history mm -hmm. and the people you're connected to because no longer am I able to see you as something other than, less mm -hmm. than, and it's only in that sacredness. All right, yes. Very well said, Hector. Um, thank you for sharing. Um, Katrina, would you mind uh, hopping in on this? Yes, um, thank you so much, Howard and Hector, for your reflections. Um, for the Southeast Asian American community, um, just wanted to give a little background and context to how many in our community came to the United States. Um, because I think what a lot of folks don't realize is for Southeast Asian Americans, um, they came into the United States um, not by choice, but due to forced circumstances. Um, at that time in the 70s and 80s, they were fleeing war and genocide um, in their home countries because of a, a US-backed war 
And as I mentioned earlier, this is ultimately what led to the largest um, resettlement and displacement of refugees in America's history at over 1.1 million. Um, and what, don't, what people don't realize is you know, a number of Southeast Asian Americans, former soldiers were recruited by the United States to fight, fight alongside them during the Vietnam War. You know, uh, Vietnamese refugees, um, they worked as translators and civil servants. Um, Cambodian refugees assisted the US military during its occupation of Cambodia. And Lao and Hmong soldiers served as guerrilla fighters in the secret war of Laos uh, together with um, the CIA. So, you know, these communities fought alongside the United States, um, helped them with this war that they were supporting. But at the time when the U.S. Um, withdrew um, and these countries fell to communist power, you know, the United States unfortunately failed to implement. They had contingency plans in place that were supposed to be protecting these allies that supported them during this war. Um, and as a result of these failed attempts, it left so many Southeast Asian American soldiers and refugees um, as targets of political persecution. Um, and then uh, resettling then into the United States with their families at the time, there was no uniform uh, system of refugee resettlement in place. So oftentimes refugees were settled ad hoc with volunteer organizations scattered across the United States, no uh, federal oversight of these programs and not a lot of robust financial support to help, to help with a long-term resettlement of refugees, aside from just the temporary immediate um, cash assistance. Um, so what we saw was there was a lot of confusion. There wasn't a lot of cultural competency um, in, within these organizations. And you're thinking about uh, a group of individuals that really survived like unspeakable trauma. They witnessed death and genocide and having to be ripped apart from that to resettle in a completely new place, but without any support on top of then, you know, being expected to uh, recover quickly and be thriving, but without that long-term support that was invested in them. So because of these experiences, what we're seeing now is a, a number of impacts. And you know, Howard mentioned it in his remarks about intergenerational trauma and about how these consequences affected those um, refugees that are initially resettled in the 70s and 80s, but also continue to impact their children. Um, and some of these impacts range from um, health um, and mental health trauma um, that was never processed, post-traumatic stress, uh, stress syndrome that was never processed or, or never being provided, cultural and linguistically competent mental health providers, for example, to service this community. We now see things like that now being passed on to their children. Um, as a result of being a resettled without a lot of support, we know that a number of these refugees were placed in communities and environments with under-resourced schools. Um, they didn't have a lot of um, support to um, find jobs that would provide a long-term economic security. Um, and then the lack of social services that were mindful to their experiences and their very nuanced journey of uh, being refugees in the United States. And because of this, what we're now seeing among the Southeast Asian American community is that many Southeast Asian American face uh, discrimination, high rates of poverty. Many of our um, young boys and men, and, and men also experience school pushout. Um, I think among Asian Americans, Southeast Asian Americans have the highest um, incarceration rates, especially in states like California. Um, and not only that, but since they came as immigrants, um, some of them are now at a risk of mandatory deportation um, for crimes committed, even if it was years and decades ago, even if they've already served their sentences, um, have completely turned their lives around and are now supporting US citizen children and families. Our current system has a complete disregard for that history and background. Um, so just like some data and stats, but you know, we know that among Southeast Asian American adults over the age of 25, about 30% of them um, do not have a high school diploma compared to 11.5% of white adults. Um, th that's the proportion of white Americans above the age of 25 that don't have a diploma. Um, we know that 62% of Southeast Asian Americans have also not attended um, college. 
And nationwide, close to 1.1 million Southeast Asian Americans are low income and close to half a million um, uh, currently live in poverty. Um, and, you know, we continue to struggle with access, um, not only to accessing health and mental care, uh, mental health services, but services that are responsive to the unique needs, um, given this background and uh, this trauma that they have survived. Um, and I think um, we would be remiss to not also talk about the United States is um, how we've contributed to some of these outcomes. And it's mainly been through policies that were passed in the past few decades that have made it difficult for these communities to really thrive. Um, in particular, when we look at policies passed in the 1990s around social uh, welfare reform, criminal justice reform, and immigration reform, it basically left, you know, not just Southeast Asian Americans, but communities of color so vulnerable without um, a robust social safety nets. Um, expanded mass incarceration and just be basically creating this deportation machine that essentially ignored the humanity of these individuals. And I think when we talk about humanity, I think it's just really honoring the lived experiences of these communities, not lumping us all and giving a one policy that will kind of address everyone's um, needs because all of our needs are very different. Um, and with Southeast Asian Americans, we've continuously have had to struggle with this invisibility, which I think is another layer of dehumanization, oftentimes being lumped under the broader Asian American category and being uplifted as this model minority of, you know, look at these Asians that are thriving. Why can't other immigrants be this way? And kind of using us as a wedge in that conversation. When you, when you actually look at the data among Southeast Asian Americans, there's actually um, grave disparity. So not understanding that and honoring that has been a reason and um, another way that these communities have been dehumanized. Um, the fact that uh, for Southeast Asian Americans, we know that um, 15,000 Southeast Asian Americans currently live in the country with a final order of removal. Um, and this is uh, basically for individuals that came as refugees, obtained their green card because of these very stringent mandatory immigration laws made them deportable without the ability to see a judge, to explain their case, to basically show that they have um, changed their lives. And the lack of that understanding and kind of pivoting um, to punitive solutions, I think has been another form of dehumanization for our communities. Um, and then finally, and I know later we'll talk about sort of the policy solutions, but I would be remiss to also not uplift um, the use of language. And that's one thing that CIRAC has tried to speak out against um, in terms of labeling our communities as felons or looking at past administrations that talked about the need to deport felons, not families, gangs, inmates, model minority, using labels like this um, has been very harmful language. Um, and again, just um, encourages people to make broad generalizations about these communities uh, without really understanding where they came from um, and understanding from them what their needs truly are to be able to thrive. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Katrina, and, and also Hector and Howard for, for sharing the different, the nuances of uh, different communities of color. I think one thing that has bound all of our communities together is the dehumanization of each of our communities. It might manifest differently um, through different policies or um, different circumstances, but it is ultimately there. Uh, and also just rooted in the five dimensions of dehumanization that we just learned about. Um, it's, it's clear that um, dehumanization can manifest uh, in, in all types of communities. Um, Hector, um, if you wanted to add just something, I know you, you mentioned that you wanted to say something really quick before we yeah. move on. I want to thank uh, Howard and Katrina because one of the things that Katrina touched on and, and one of the things that I think is important to, 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 to lift out is that within the, the immigrant community, especially the ones that come from Mexico and South America and beyond, really if we arrive and we lend this country simply our, our backs and our arms, you know, they're willing to let us uh, be essential, right? And, and harvest the food that everybody needs to eat. Yeah. 
and we become, you know, that, and that's an acceptable role uh, that, that we're offered, right? It's when we then, in, when we contribute the intellect to long-term solutions that we get in the way, right? And so the history of how our families come to the United States, much like Katrina was outlining, uh, that kind of story for economic purposes, I think is very, very important to, to highlight. The difference is, is that um, we get grouped together in those really uh, dehumanizing ways and the policies that Katrina and Howard really addressed uh, affect the current wave of immigrants now. Uh, it's not history, right? It's not history. It remains alive today in how we characterize the people that are attempting to come and contribute to this country. Uh, and it, it is absolutely couched in dehumanization unless you're offering this nation the strength of your back and your arms. Then we will look the other way uh, so that you can do what nobody else in this country was willing to do. Yeah. Hector, that's a really good point. Um, there's so much we can learn about our history, but it applies to right now. Uh, we're having the same uh, discussion, same conversations around dehumanization uh, with our current immigration system um, and furthermore. Uh, so thank you for sharing that. Um, we, we want to also open up the space for um, our audience to get involved in, in this conversation. So we're gonna have a polling question. Um, so wherever you are on Twitter or YouTube, um, this is our question. So after listening to the presentations around dehumanization, uh, framework and conversation about the historical and current context around historical dehumanization specifically. Did you learn anything about your community, other communities, or both your community and others that you had not known before? And uh, we'll have like a, a shorter uh, a version of that um, posted in our um, various uh, streams. But I think what this has really highlighted to me, I learned so much. Uh, again, thank you, uh, Katrina, Hector, and, and Howard for really um, laying it plain for, for us to be able to see um, the nuances of what impacts each of our communities, but also um, as Hector just kind of uh, up, uh, lifted was our um, being, being bound together by um, these different uh, dehumanizing practices. So again, the question more simply is, did you learn things about your community, other communities, or both um, yours and others that you had not known before? And as we are um, looking for uh, just like the responses from the audience, uh, as we, we have a little bit of time, I um, wanted to ask the panelists like one more question. Uh, what do you believe comes to mind for others when they think of historical dehumanization or trauma for your community? And if that's, is that different from what your community would say that it is? And this is open to all the panelists, if, if you wanted to chime in uh, as we get more responses in our uh, streams. I would say, um, I think um, the only thing I would add is we, we, we understand kind of the trauma of Southeast Asian Americans that came to the United States um, from an outside looking in. But one thing that maybe we want to uplift a little bit more and from the outside looking in, folks might not realize as much of is also celebrating the resilience of this community. You know, they did suffer a lot and survive a lot, but we also want to focus on where they are today, you know, and how they are thriving in some ways here in the United States, but in ways that maybe might not be recognized in the mainstream. Um, so I think just um, honoring their legacy and also kind of celebrating um, that journey as well um, and reframing from just seeing it simply from like a deficit perspective, um, I think is the only thing I'd like to add. Yeah, it's a really good point. 
So the, the thing that I would say is that I think we're coming to a deeper understanding that traumas that have been characterized as historic traumas um, are not just history. They are embedded in the story and narratives of our families and our relatives. And as a consequence, I think what oftentimes is inconvenient for, for people to see as they see a man presenting like me today, and they say, you know, what's wrong with you, Hector? You know, why, why are you always looking to the past? Because I think in looking to that past and recognizing mm -hmm. that past allows us to uncover the medicine that Katrina alludes to in that medicine mm -hmm. of survival that will help us and position us for moving forward. You know, I oftentimes, you know, my father would be the man who always would be the, the, the centering uh, for me, for me, right? Uh, would say things to me that would really touch me in ways that I never did. And he would always, as a way to kind of compel that sense of American arrogance that we were raised in this dominant culture to really believe, he'd say, Mijo, son, before you remember that before you opened your eyes today, two women have already prayed for you, right? Mm -hmm. And what a humbling thing for a young man who could not understand what that meant, right? I just, now I'm beginning to grasp the depth of what my father is and paying it by being one of the prayers of the family, right? Contributing the prayers that have been put into me, now I'm trying to put them in, the, in, in others, right? And so when I think about that kind of history that we don't want to con, uh, acknowledge because it's uncomfortable, inconvenient, and traumatizing, what we know is that there were things that were happening simultaneously that allowed us to find out who we were, root ourselves, and if we were lucky to listen very carefully and how that was. And so um, I, I think it's, uh, you know, Katrina highlights this thing that, yes, there are all these disparities and impacts. And then there are all these things that are happening that people have activated those historical medicine tools to get us to where we are today. And we can hold both of those things, right? It's not an either or. And so for our communities, I think it's important to acknowledge that history and not overlook it because it's really inconvenient to share right? But to also recognize all that prayer that happened that allows me to be here today, right? Sharing some, some insights that I've gleaned from interactions with other people and things that I've come to understand. Yeah, I just echo what's been said from Katrina and Hector, and I'm particularly the point of, you know, some people think trauma informed is that we're going to go back and only look at the, the negative stuff. In reality, um, you know, we, because we've been in Western world, you know, there's this wonderful uh, statement that uh, Malefi Asante made about, about Western arrogance and Western knowledge. And he said, it, it called it a peculiar arrogance. It's the arrogance of not knowing what it is that they do not know, yet they speak as if they know what all of us need to know. And I have found that a wonderful gift to, to, um, to disentangle the, the lies, if that makes any sense. And I think one of the benefits of going back is that we catch from our ancestors these gems that are tools. That, and they may be for the, the big policies and the practices, but they also may be for when somebody disrespects you in a moment. You need a medicine for a moment as much as you need one for the policy. And that one helped me get through 30 years at the University of Pennsylvania, to be honest with you, right? That, that I can see this as a lie. This is not my story. And I think um, in many respects, going back, uh, as Hector's really clearly said, can be a gift. We can unearth the things that we forgot. Those uneducated people that I grew up in Southern Delaware, who told me that be careful of getting too much education because you could lose yourself, were telling the truth. <laughs> they were they were preparing me in ways at that time I thought they did not know about the world. Mm -hmm. And in many respects, I can use that wisdom. I can use that gem today, no matter what anybody throws at me, but I can't give up my people in the process, if that makes any sense. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Howard. Um, and again, thank you to our panel for uh, really giving us a historical and, and current description of how each of our communities are being dehumanized, um, but also doing so in ways that uplift our ancestors and uplift the work that we're doing currently, which is what we're going to uh, transition to after we take a quick uh, 
uh, breather. I know this has been a pretty heavy uh, last hour. Uh, so we are actually bringing in um, Dr. Phyllis Hubbard. Uh, so Phyllis Hubbard, Dr. Phyllis Hubbard will help to have us recenter and, and stretch and, and breathe a little bit. Um, so I'll, I'm gonna hand over the mic over to Dr. Hubbard. Um, thank you so much for, for joining us this, this morning. Thank you so much for having me and thank you to the panelists for sharing and for uplifting the medicine uh, because the medicine is important, not just to, to talk about, but to embody within ourselves. And so that's what I'd like to invite you all to do by first sharing a mantra that I think is really important. And that is, it's important for us to allow the stressors that we're talking about to move through us without getting stuck in us so that we're able to move forward and choose the actions that serve our highest good. So with that said, I'd like to invite everyone to stand up um, and do a quick stretch. And we're gonna do a very quick breathing exercise. And so I can't see you, it's okay. <laughs> and so what I'm going to ask you all to do is to plant your feet on the ground, tuck your tailbone under, Pull the shoulders up, back, and down. We're gonna breathe in and lift our arms up overhead. And then we're going to reach up and exhale, relax the shoulders down. Now we're gonna breathe in and reach up again. And as we exhale, we're gonna ease our way to the left. Hinging from the hips, relaxing the body. Breathe in, reach up. Exhale, ease our way to the right. Breathe in, reach up. Exhale, bring our hands down and we're going to place our left palm over right if you're Identify as female or right palm over left as you identify as male over the over the heart center, the left side of the chest. We're gonna take three collective breaths together to the count of four. We're gonna breathe into the count of four, hold our breath for four seconds, exhale to the count of four and hold our breath for four seconds. And as we exhale, I want you to consider those things that you may be holding that you want to let go of. Let the oxygen provide the medicine. So here we go. I'm gonna take a breath in, two, three, four. Hold the breath, two, three, four. Exhale, two, three, four. Hold the breath two, three, four. Two more times, breathe in, two, three, four. Hold the breath, two, three, four. Relax your shoulders, exhale, two, three, four. Hold the breath, two, three, Four One more time, breathe it in, two, three, four, hold the breath, two, three, four, exhale, two, three, four, and hold the breath, two, three, four. Good, and take a breath in, bring the palms together in a prayer position and bring the palms between the eyebrows. And we'll close out this practice by taking a breath in. And as we exhale, remind ourselves to allow our eyes to be windows and not projectors. Just see what's there. Lower the palms in front of the mouth, taking a breath in. And as we exhale, remind ourselves to speak our truth as we're doing today, even though we believe it may cause discomfort to others. 
bringing the healing medicine of speaking truth to power. And then lowering the palms in front of the heart, taking a breath in. And as we exhale, reminding ourselves that when we speak from the heart, we will always be serving the highest good of all. Take a breath in and exhale. You can lower the hands down and then slowly take your seats or stay standing if you like. And try to do this practice as often as you can throughout the day, especially when you feel the stress beginning to build. Allow the stress to move through you without getting stuck in you. Thank you. Take care. Be well and be radiant. Thank you so much, Dr. Hubbard. Um, it was much, much, much needed. Um, really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. So we uh, are going to transition to our uh, third segment. And this is a segment that we're going to talk about what I'm sure a lot of you uh, are really interested to know about, which is the solutions. So we're going to keep uh, Howard, Hector, and, and Katrina uh, on for, for this segment. So we're going to talk about um, how we can channel our understanding of dehumanization uh, historically and, and currently, and then channel that into uh, solutions for the future. And before we uh, move on, I just want to send a reminder that if you have any questions for the panelists, uh, feel free to just put them into the YouTube or um, uh, Twitter streams, and we'll get to them after this uh, session. And then also that um, thank you also for participating in our poll. We, we definitely saw that a lot of folks uh, have learned a lot about uh, not only just their own community, but other communities as well. And so we appreciate you all participating in that. So um, without further ado, I'm going to pass the mic over to um, Howard to begin us, uh, begin talking about solutions uh, for the discussion that we've been talking about. Okay, so um, it's there's so many different ideas to think about regarding solutions, but the proverb I, I read uh, earlier has helped me also in 30 years to navigate uh, westernized spaces, but also to reconnect to what my family and my community where I grew up were telling me when I was just a child. And so uh, the lion story will never be known as long as the hunter is the one to tell it. For me has meant my job is to help other people, young people, families fall in love with their own stories, fall in love with their own narratives, because that is what I think um, this dehumanization that we see people thinking they're better than other people is trying to drum out of us that, that the very love of who we were, who we are and who we could possibly be. And most of our bodies, our minds and our hearts and souls are the stage or the playground upon which we see the effects of that dehumanization. And, and I would say, can I help young people? And then we've been talking about boys, young men of color, um, but also who they are connected to fall in love with their own narratives. Can they tell their own stories? Can they tell the stories in a style and the way that they were growing, that they grew up to learn how to be, right? Um, cultural style is a disruption. The very fact that I can walk into a space and turn heads by the way I walk, by the way I roll is a, is a, is a medicine whether we know it or not, because it sends other people crazy. And if we can teach young people to realize that they have that kind of power to affect space, to affect air, to affect turned heads, right? That is something I think very key and important. And so what do I learn from my cultural style, right? You know, I used to tell a story and, you know, in a, you know, why in a black church could you have a song that only has like three verses last for almost a half an hour? They could sing that song over and over and over and over again. And I could never bring my friends to church because they couldn't, they couldn't understand why I would a song. And the part of it is, is the way in which that song triggers memories, triggers stories from others 
loved ones who died, who passed, who almost died, but still stayed to this day alive, that song is a chance for us to engage with that world of healing, right? And it doesn't make sense to a lot of people, but that would be one example for me that our, our culture is a disruption. Another example I would give is, you know, we, we think of, uh, in my work on racial literacy, um, I think a lot of folks are now saying, how do we sit with discomfort? And I think that's important, but I don't think people do well sitting with discomfort. So part of the, the, the idea that I think of around helping people navigate racial encounters, uh, because the research we get more now is not only the policies and practices that are, that are affecting us historically, but it's also these daily microaggressions, these daily hurts. And we could listen to the television the primary, we can listen to the, to the, to the convention and, and, and the hurts come after us. They come after our family, they come after our grandparents, they come to, after our siblings. And I have been in schools with children who have been crying, students have been crying because they watched the primary the night before because those narratives were coming at their own families. They did not know what to do. So we came up over the last decade, a sense of what's called racially healthy comeback lines. And this will be my last uh, suggestion or solution and I'll turn over. And that, that's because we need medicine in the moment. We need to know how to navigate when somebody in one moment says you don't belong or you are not human or you are animal. And because all the many people that I've run into over the years, thousands of folks, when I ask them about an incident that happened to them about their difference in particular their race, there are folks in their 80s who remember something in their childhood and they will be telling it as if it just happened. And that's one way we think about trauma, right? And one of the things that, that hurts them the most is I didn't have my voice. I did not speak up against it, right? So a racially healthy comeback line is meant for you to speak to the moment where you say, I reject your rejection of me. I will not take one step. I will not move from this space. I will not allow you to think for a moment that I accept this negative medicine, this horrible inferiority. I will not take it, I reject it. And you can, you can say it to yourself first, which is most important. You could say it to your ancestors first, which is more important. You really don't even have to say it to the other, but you say it to yourself so that you don't walk away wishing you could have, should have done something and carrying that with you for the rest of your life. Now I could go further, but I wanna let my colleagues come in. I think we need medicine for the, for the history of, of dehumanization, but we need it also for the moments. Um, so I'll stop there. Thanks for sharing, Hector. Well, you know, so I have the pleasure of having uh, been influenced greatly, not only by, by, by family, but by kinship family, people that have um, welcomed me into their circle and have reminded me of things that perhaps that I had overlooked. And I would say that one of the things that we do with young people is that we begin to reestablish those kinship relationships so that we can have those conversations that Dr. Stevenson speaks about, which are not easy conversations to have. They need to be made in a sense of trust so that when I share uh, my reality, that I am not gonna share it and you're gonna use it for um, entertainment purposes or deeper understanding that when I share my story, um, I'm learning a little bit more about you, right? And so as a consequence, when we sit in circle, the beauty of sitting in circle and reconnecting to that historic tradition of four directions that basically forces to acknowledge all the relationships that we carry in our lives. So. Each direction symbolizes our relationship with elders and ancestors, children, male, female. And we sit in that, in the middle of all that, wondering how it is that we're going to do this. And so when we do this with young people, they are beginning to connect to an ancestral process that allows them to explore who it is, who they're becoming, and that it, in that authentic way, it's all good in the circle right? When that space is held right, uh, we welcome your authentic self here. Not only do we, ex you know, uh, because young people will say, well, I'm struggling in my relationship with my, my parents, if they have them, or, or, or caregivers and whatnot. 
And so they identify the struggles in that reality. But we remind them that they come from, you know, four great grandparents, right? Or four grandparents, eight great grandparents, and goes on and on and on and on in generations. And so therefore, whatever you feel you're carrying right now, you have something to draw from to do that. And, and as imperfect beings, we sometimes need to be held accountable amongst ourselves, right? So it's not as if I sit there as a perfect being knowing how to do this perfectly, but I am going to be in the struggle so that when other people show up in my circle, that I learn to listen intently, that I learn to connect deeply, and that I recognize that the individuals in the circle are also connected to other people. And that medicine begins um, to create that, that dialogue that, that's so important that Dr. Stevenson alludes to is that that self-talk, right? That although there has been trauma, how is it that I uncover the gifts so that I'm not overwhelmed with the baggage? And as Maestro Jerry today often tells us, it's not that we wanna get rid of the baggage, we just want it to be balanced in harmony so that one doesn't overwhelm the other ones, because I think it's important to recognize and understand that. And what's surprising to me is that young people think that our authentic self is that how do I integrate all these aspects of who I am uh, as a son of Mexican immigrants? And how is it that I hold it, right? And if you work that muscle, you begin to value all parts of who you are. And when you see it in other people, you recognize. So you see professors that are doing indigenous practices and, in, and, and weaving it into how they teach. You see social workers that are, that, give, that are given the gift of dance, right? And they exhibit their way of dancing as a way to heal communities, right? And then you have the long walkers, right? People like Don Marcelino from the Huirarica tradition, which we call uh, uh, Micholes, right? That's what we call, who have been praying for, for us for nearly a century, right? And you sit, the, you know, when you begin to understand that that person, when I see Don Marcelino, it reminds me of my grandmother, mm -hmm. who although we were never told explicitly, I don't believe she ever sat in a classroom in her entire life, right? And so I don't carry her wisdom yet, but I pray that her spirit informs my thoughts uh, so that when I speak and she were to hear me speak, that she would recognize herself in my words, right? And by doing that, we begin to see it amongst those generations of people that are to come, that they are connected to this lineage of medicine. Uh, and, and yes, we will use that lineage of medicine to fight for more equitable policy and changes in systems and, and eradication of systems, but it's part and parcel. We do that because we are who we are, and I don't apologize for that. Thank you so much, Hector. Um, Katrina, would you mind uh, joining us? Yes. Um, so I really appreciated the comments made around um, story and parts of storytelling and authenticity. Um, and I totally agree with um, Hector and Howard um, that that is one of the key solutions I feel like. And I think that kind of goes hand in hand with the importance of narrative change. I was reading a book recently and there was a quote that really struck me and it reminded me of this panel actually had me reflecting, but in the book it said that without dignity, identity is erased. And in its absence, men are defined not by themselves, but by their captors and the circumstance in which they are forced to live. So I think when we talk about narrative change, um, for us, it's really important for communities to share their stories and highlights the importance of self-determination. Um, so allowing communities to tell their stories, um, to inform policies that they feel like would be helpful for them um, and not to be defined by the circumstances they were in and um, labeling them in that, in that way, um, but providing them the opportunity to share their stories that allows us to see their full humanity and their, uh, their full dignity. Mm -hmm. So I think it's just um, allowing for those spaces and for dialogues like this um, to happen more frequently. Um, 
is definitely a breath of fresh air. And I think in terms of with direct engagement with our communities and particularly boys and men of color, I think back at one experience I had when I had first started at CRAC. We hosted uh, this convening at uh, San Quentin State Prison in California. Uh, it was hosted by this group called the Asian Prisoner Support Committee. They're basically a volunteer organization that taught ethnic studies. Um, it was a, a curriculum based on ethnic studies that they brought um, within the prison system, specifically targeted to Asian American um, incarcerated individuals. Um, and it was so enlightening for me because we had these men um, crying and sharing and just breaking down, sharing stories about how when they were younger, not having a lot of choices, um, being bullied, feeling like they had no other option and, and were forced into a certain circumstances, which then led them into the prison system. And they had shared that this is the first time that I've had individuals let me share my story um, basically let me share my humanity. And it was inside like the prison system. And we realized that creating spaces like this and programs like this was helpful for these individuals, even outside the prison system, that there was a study that showed that um, for those that re-entered, recidivism rates were cut in half for individuals that were able to avail of programs like this. So I think culturally and linguistically competent curriculum, ethnic studies, um, making that available to our students um, and youth um, really can shape outcomes in their life um, and help to somewhat um, heal some of the traumas that they've never had the space to process in the past. Um, and then and finally, I think with policy solutions, I touched on it a little bit more but uh, earlier, but shifting away from policies that look uh, that come up with solutions that are very black or white mm -hmm. basically say that one solution is a one size fit all for everybody no matter what the circumstance is circumstances and then shifting away from policies that have a hyper focus on punitive measures um, and ex instead try to focus on some transformative and restorative justice um, solutions. So instead of just incarcerating folks and, or deporting folks, really getting to the root of what were the circumstances that have led to these um, ultimate outcomes. So addressing things like poverty, right? Um, um, our public education system. Um, secondly, I think, I guess that goes hand in hand is promoting policies that allow for the use of more discretion um, so that we do honor the humanity of all of our communities by understanding individual circumstances instead of prescribing um, policy solution and interventions um, that don't really address these root causes. Um, and for CRAC, in one policy solution that's been very important for us is um, the importance of data. Um, reporting it, collecting it, um, that kind of goes hand in hand again with uplifting our nuanced stories versus clumping us under one category and using that data to inform these policy interventions. Um, and then lastly, I would say that among lawmakers, continuing to engage directly with these impacted communities so that they have a say in these solutions, they can share their journey to where they are today. Um, and it allows for these lawmakers to get a better understanding of their needs. Um, and I think ultimately these are some solutions that could help break this cycle of dehumanization. Absolutely, thank you so much, Katrina. And, and, and also just thank you to all the panel uh, panelists. You all provided, uh, uh, Sorry, Heck, did you want to say something? Yeah, I just I just want to add one of the things that to the lexicon, and that's that's just what Howard and Katrina talked about. In that, you know, at the National Compadres Network, we're talking about the sacredness of an individual, which I think is, if you look on the spectrum of dehumanization, you know, when you when you don't see the humanity of a person, and when you see on the opposite end, sacredness, right? That is that what it is that they carry. Uh, what Katrina and Howard talked about is, is having us internally move along that continuum of that spectrum, right? So that when the young people are part of these programs, they are uncovering and, and, and disclosing and, and recognizing maybe for the first instance, their sacredness, their family's sacredness and their history's sacredness, right? And, and we shy away from that because sacred doesn't fit in policy. 
it's it's an immeasurable thing, right? And maybe this work is transcends uh, the way of really recognizing it in the Western way that that Howard uh, was alluding to. That maybe it is that our ancestors will inform the way we move along that, and and at some point, Western thinking may catch up to us. That's a really good point. I think the way that you all spoke, you spoke in ways that uh, present solutions in the way that we change, the way that we speak with each other, the way that we share our narratives, uh, the way that we share, uh, change the way that we uh, have direct service. And also as Katrina and Hector just mentioned, just also in how we implement policies, right? So given all of these different ways we can begin this solution um, towards a, a, against a dehumanization. My question for you all is, what challenges have you had in trying to implement um, the things that you just spoke of? And this is open to all of, uh, all of you. And also a follow-up is like, how have you been able to overcome that challenge? Are there any ways that you've been able to think about that as well? I'll allude to one, is that we have this beautiful, I, I'm standing on this panel with these beautiful people that are intellectually stimulating and, and all of this. But outside of this bubble of thinking, we can be thinking in a very separated way. So that if what Howard is pushing for and receiving support for somehow diminishes what I'm availed, available for, this whole divide and conquer thing, is oftentimes what happens in community. So if, I, if I'm going to, uh, we're gonna go in and support a community that say, well, why are you doing it here and not over there, right? And so that whole uh, concept of limited resources and therefore, uh, if you do something for somebody, you're not doing it for others, right? And, and with us, I think here in California, what we began to do is really collaborate deeply because there's no such thing as, uh, a Latinx, Latino, Latina community, they're, they're blended, they're blended, right? We have uh, Asian, Southeast Asian brothers, you know, you go to Long Beach, you'll begin to see how the black, brown, Southeast Asian communities uh, both live and struggle together, right? And, and so I think that one of the things that we have to recognize is that when we walk in, we're actually opening doors. We're opening doors so that many people can come in and we will not prescribe the medicine that you need, but we will create the opportunities for people begin to begin to uncover it for themselves by inviting that part of the community in. And so the struggle is to not take the bait, to not take the bait so that if Howard comes in, that somehow or other that diminishes what I have and what I carry, right? That I trust that his medicine is sacred and it will be informative to me too. Right. And the second part of it is this illusion that that, you know, that in, in 20, 30, 40 years that we're going to be different. Right. If history proves anything, is we're going to become much more interwoven in that sacred term that we use in the Nahuatl language, in Tuloque and Nahuatl, that we're going to be integ integrated and we should be integrated in that deep sense of understanding and love for one another. But the reality is, is that our communities may not have ever had the pleasure of having this kind of conversation yet. And so it's incumbent upon when I walk into the door to walk in the door with people that also reflect their story and their history. And so our Healing Generations Institute that is done in collaboration with the Brotherhood of Elders based out of Oakland is deep and rich. And we do this work so that when we have an opportunity to walk in, that they people see one another. And that's just the beginning. That that Healing Institute is, going, is, is now expanding to welcome people that are interested in doing this from other uh, parts of our families, not from other communities, from other parts of our family. And, and that's a struggle because when you're traumatized, you traumatize other people. Mm. But when you uncover the healing, you can become the healing for other people as well. And that's the struggle that we encounter is it? which Hector shows up. We, and so I have the power to show up in my healing, in my healed sense of who it is in that struggle. But don't get me wrong. You know, there may be days when the traumatized Hector has to show uh, 
that it's present so that uh, it's not damaging, but that people recognize he understands a little bit about this journey. It's a really good point. Thank you, Hector. I think um, uh, to build off of what Hector said, uh, I think the importance of solidarity work right now is very essential. Um, when it comes to policy change, you know, we always come up with um, pushback from lawmakers if it's not politically feasible at the moment or doable. But I remember that one of the key questions when we engage with these offices, um, they ask is, well, what other organizations are you working in solidarity with? You know, they want to know that it's not just the Southeast Asian American issues, but it impacts other communities as well. Um, and to ensure that we are working together um, to push these solutions. So I think showing up for each other, um, when uh, showing up for each other as allies, um, and I think this goes hand in hand too with um, the narrative change work as well, making sure that when we talk about not only, not only our own communities, but other communities, um, that we're using the language that is uh, respectful and is, I guess, doesn't continue to promote a dehumanization in ways that we might not think about. Um, when we um, engage in these conversations. Um, and I think finally, continuing to educate our own communities. So for Southeast Asian Americans, there was a huge, um, there was a lot of debate following um, what happened in Minnesota with George Floyd. There's a huge Hmong population there, the number of Hmong business owners. And, you know, we were getting a lot of pushback and heat from these individuals about, well, you know, why aren't you supporting the Hmong who was, uh, there was a cop who was Hmong, I believe, or these business owners. Um, and a lot of our community organizers on the ground, they took up the task of kind of pushing back within their own communities. And they took that as a responsibility that, you know, it's my job to educate my family. Um, it's my job to push back on hateful things that they say. And as a result, you know, these organizers ended up getting targeted by their own community members. But in a sense, that's what they defined as being true allies and really standing in true solidarity with one another. So I think continuing to find ways to support each other in that way um, is a great uh, first step or solution. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I love I love what I'm hearing. And from my colleagues, it's just been, it's in lifting, just, it's uh, healing to hear both of you. Um, and I, I just, you know, um, it's amazing how the very things that we are known for because of our differences as being problems are the very things that lead us to understand who we really are, right? That if you want to see your strength, right? You know, if we if we walk into a room and people turn heads, how can we see that as a power, right? And if we realize that these police officers who are not knowing themselves, who do not have a sense of history, who follow and stalk our young people, that they actually are zombies. They're the walking dead, that, that our boys and our children are not, are not the ones who are really bizarre. They are just being themselves. And I think um, trying to translate that into a policy uh, may be difficult, but I do believe that um, the way in which um, my colleagues have shared today, you know, that there is a particular kind of narrative that says, you don't belong to me, that we can challenge, that you're not a part of me, is a, it, that's, that's something we can speak to, right? And, and I think many of us were trained in models and systems where we were thought to be distant, to disengage, to stay, to not get too close. And, and yet, in fact, I don't know how you could be an educator in this world and, and, and be good for everybody and not see your children and these other children, right? And I've said to police officers, I've said to educators, when you see my two children, I want you to see your children. Because I know mm -hmm. if you see your children, when mine show up, you will not shoot them. You will not expel them. You will not mistreat them. You'll think twice if they, make, if they stumble or they stutter. And I would argue that that's, that's a humanity, right, that I see in you 
uh, some part of mine, right? And I, and I think, um, you know, you can get emotional just thinking about it, but that's what I think we're asking for in this world. And the irony is that we have moral uh, so-called Christian folks who are at the forefront of the dehumanization. Um, and that is, that is also a lesson. So I think our job is to educate because not everybody knows that this work, this stuff is intergenerational. They, not everybody understands historical trauma. So how do we teach our own people that this, it didn't just start last week or last year or when, you know, and, and in a sense we have work to do uh, in that regard, but um, our very being is disruptive. And I, I just wanna assert that. You know, Dr. Stevenson, you said something really powerful that, you know, if we look back at our languages, if we really knew our languages, we would have the words for it. The Nahuatl yeah. word for this is in la kech, in mm. la kech, which means you are my other me. Mm. Right? Mm -hmm. So it, it, it is to create these deep relationships where we are woven into the, a relationship that I, not only do I see you, not yeah. only that, you are part of me. Yeah. And if that is mutual, you know, so in English, I don't know if we have a word for that, right? <laughs> but, but the Nahuatl language had a word for that, right? That is the ultimate in relationship. En la quech, tú eres mi otro yo. You are my other me. Can mm -hmm. you imagine if yeah. we walked around seeing that? Uh, the ch my, my the hairs on my arms uh, yes. just spur because yes we don't even have if we if we knew our original languages we would have words for it mm -hmm. and we would say if I said to you if you said to me well what kind of relational do you want to what relationship do you want to have mm -hmm. with me I could say transactional right you got mm -hmm. something that I need let's let's yes. figure it out or I want an in la catch relationship with you yeah. and. and and the journey to that is a very different one. Mm -hmm. Hector, that reminds me of a word, uh, Ubuntu. I am because you are, or I am because we are. And I think that also just translates to the importance of language and how that plays into um, when, we, when we're having these conversations. So yes. thank you for uplifting that. Um, so we are, we have a few more minutes left. Uh, I really want to, have our audience engage uh, in a Q&A with our panelists. Uh, but before we do that, we have one more polling question for you all. So the panel um, discussed a few different disrupting strategies, uh, narrative change, policy change, advocacy, uh, or like supporting through di direct service. Um, so we wanted to ask you, what are you all doing in your work are you uplifting narrative change? Are you supporting boys and men of color through direct service, uh, supporting boys and men of color through policy change and advocacy? And, uh, the policy or the, the poll will be posted in a moment on your various streams. Um, but we're gonna take a few minutes for you all to, to kind of ex uh, access that. But as we are doing, um, as folks are filling that poll out, I wanted to ask you all just one more question. So what's one thing that each person viewing um, this session can do to disrupt dehumanization today? Um, and once we uh, kind of go through some of these answers, I'll share the poll results and then also share the, the questions that you all post in the chats. And I <laughs> Go ahead, Katrina. I oh, would say- And Linda will also be joining us for, for this section. <laughs> uh, just super quick. I would just say, continue to question and don't accept things as they are. Um, you know, we, there, there's always an argument about, well, this is what's legal, but I tried to shift the framework to, okay, what is legal versus what it's just and who, who put these policies in place to begin with? So I think continuing to accept things, uh, continuing to challenge things and not just accept the status quo all the time um, is one little thing that folks could do. You know, 
uh, I would offer one of the things that I learned was um, in, in our neighborhood, you know, you walk into a room and you scan it and you acknowledge and you make eye contact and you do uh, head nods and whatnot. And that's just the way you, you're unconscious about doing that, right? Uh, you just don't, you just do this because you're, that's part of the environment. In college, I had a professor, um, uh, Rich McClenney, uh, who, who, who gave me the understanding of that because here was a professor who would walk in and do the same scan and I would watch him, right? And so one day we were watching a baseball game together and I asked him, you do what we do? And he says, he says, he said, hell yeah, Hector. He says, I walk in to find allies in the room every single time, right? Every time I walk in. And uh, here was this man who, who then broke it down for me uh, and, and, and told me why I learned these things before I even understood them, right? And so to this day, I still do that. Uh, you walk into spaces and you make that eye contact and you you nod your head a little bit just to say, you know, not only I see you, but if things go down, guess what? You know, it's going to it's going to go down and you and I got your back. Right. And sometimes you don't even know how it's going to go down, what that person's going to say. And I remember Rich mm -hmm. McClenney used to say, never contradict, uh, but save it for later when nobody else is around. Right. And so those are things that I think that, that I have learned and, and it works well in my family. You know, that's that teaching that Rich offered you. Sometimes mm -hmm. you, you just nod and, and, you, and you save it for later so that you can have a deeper conversation alone. And so those are the things that I think that <clears throat> are historically taught to us that bode well today. You know, that as we're building this, this solidarity that we know how to do this and that if we do this well, people will re recognize that we're not undermining, but rather building, strengthening the foundation. <clears throat> so we were on an earlier Forward Promise uh, webinar, and I uh, was just after somebody had gotten murdered, and I was pissed off. I'll be honest with you, I was, I was livid. And I and Hector, just to give you an example, um, you know, I was he was telling he could tell that I was fired up, right, in a in a particular way, and I was angry, you know. And you know, when you have seen so much uh, mm -hmm. violation and, and dehumanization, you want to hurt somebody. It's just natural. But it's not healthy, if that makes sense. It's natural, but it's not healthy. And in a sense, I you said to me, um, you know, um, and it reminded me of Wayne Nobles, who's the great elder uh, genius in my mind, who said once that the that power is the ability to define reality and make others believe it as if it were their own. And you said something to me, Hector. You said, "Don't take the bait." What you said earlier, "Don't don't take the bait." And I and I find that essential as a feedback that. You know, we need spaces, healing spaces, where we can be angry, where we can be enraged, right? But not in the dangerous spaces where people will misunderstand that, and and uh, um, and yet be able to not take the bait and not swallow someone else's definition of of power, because that's not our reality. And I, I would leave that for anybody. And um, I appreciate all of you being here today. It's been fantastic. So I'll take that as a, as a shameless plug opportunity that if you go to the Healing Generations podcast and you go back about three podcasts ago, the wonderful and yeah. illustrious Dr. Wade Noble was having a conversation uh, with Maestro Jerry Theo. And yeah. in that podcast, if you want to know more about what you just shared, you get it from the Maestro of Maestros, right? Which yeah. is the, the, the true people, right? And so... Yes. Go visit that podcast and check it out because uh, when I re-listen to it, man, uh, same words, different meaning every time I listen to it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Rhonda, did you want to share anything before? You know, I think if there's one thing that people can do right now is um, commit to the young people in their lives and commit to them that um, they will be that space of affirmation every day. And they will be the place that young people can come to draw strength when they are facing um, these examples of dehumanization that are happening right now in our lives, but also when they need a place for somebody to help them to understand the history of dehumanization that they didn't live through, but they're feeling the impacts still in their souls today. Um, so just commit to being that place for the young people that, that you love and then think about what is the way that you can expand your reach 
beyond that small circle of young people to an even greater sphere of young people. Because I think what we have to be doing if we are going to disrupt is to raise up a generation of young people that are equipped with both the knowledge and the power to say that today enough is enough and we are going to harness our strength and work in solidarity to make change so that the next generation that comes behind us isn't having these same conversations, but they live in a place that's much more beautiful and much more um, loving and accepting of them. And like Hector said, that sees their sacredness. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you, Rhonda. Um, I want to uh, highlight a question that was asked um, a few minutes ago by Angeline Dean. Question is, uh, what literature would you recommend to cite for scholars? I have some, but she would like to hear some more from you all. And uh, before we kind of dig deep into that, we have a, a paper that I'll be talking about in a second. Um, but if anyone would like to share any other um, resources for, for Angeline, that'd be great. As I look around, I'm not sitting at the desk that I normally sit at because I'm, I'm in my office and not at a place where I work at at home now most of the time. But there's a new book that comes out that talks about um, indigenous ways of knowing and research, which is uh, couched in um, the narrative stories. And what I will do is I'll make sure that I get the title of that book uh, to, to Rhonda and the team at, at Forward Promise so that they can uh, uh, share that. But as you read that, um, it basically teaches us a different way of accumulating information from our own perspective. And it begins to deconstruct this whole sense that Western research of knowing um, that is data driven alone is the only way to do that. And unfortunately for scholars, that's the world that they swim in, right? That you have to basically look at the deficits that have been captured and documented for years. And so this new book, I make sure that you get does that. And then there's another book that also begins to address the issues of how it is that when you're seeking mental health services, uh, how it is that you root yourself in a way to better serve people that have indigenous roots or roots that are not strictly, you know, white European ways, right? And that I think it applies more broadly than for Latino, Latinx and Latinas, uh, but, but that's informative and that's a new book. That one's rather expensive. It's uh, published by, by Sage mm -hmm. and I'd be, you know, I also want to highlight that there's canon, like there's there's the, the canon of, of the ivory tower, but in our communities, we have a canon too that transcends its music, it is literature, mm -hmm. and it is ways of, of knowing. And so for us, when you read the poets of, of, of our time, right, that really speak to what we do, that is medicine. And that if you work with young people, you... you they have this naturally ingrained in them. And they, you know, to use the term, we spit it and, 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 and you feel it, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so just connecting them to that history that, they, that, that has built that canon of our knowledge and literature is really important, you know, um, you know so, so we have it and it's in, it transcends its music. It's, it's all these things. And, it, and, and our children are watching because they reflect it to us all the time. Uh, and so I would say that, and, and uh, so I would, I would point people to the canon of within, within uh, communities and then share that canon with other people so that we can begin to understand, you know, what was that journey of Malcolm X and that, in that Sentinel, the autobiography of Malcolm X, right? What is, what is that journey uh, teach me about my journey, right? And so although those are historic uh, books, that seem to be, uh, if you will, kind of ever present, they need to be always pushed to the front so that if you don't get it in the ivory tower, you're getting uh, Maestro Jose Montoya, you're getting those kinds of stories fed to you uh, early. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. Any uh, other resources? Um, I would throw out an option. Um, so the Equal Justice Initiative, uh, I think, has done the best research in the country on lynching. And uh, just recently, uh, they put out a report about a month and a half, two months ago, on reconstruction, just another narrative around history. 
um, they have the best, the extensive data on lynching in this country, and it's still an unknown folks that they haven't gotten yet. So we knew there were 4,000, uh, over 4,000 lynchings between the, the, the late uh, 19th century into the mid 20th century. But what they recently have done is just look at reconstruction between 1870, uh, 1860, six to 1875 and found 4,000 more lynchings. And so what that I think says as a place to go for data is one thing, research. But it's ironic that that increased level of violence and the, and he just, and the, the report describes also just excessive levels of violence in that short period of time. The very time reconstruction was about to begin and, and, and was an ex, as an experiment did not, um, complete, but um, it's ir ironic that at the very time that we are talking about social change, you also have this excessive level of violence. And I think in our history, we also have to learn from that. You know, how is it that we have these moments of growth, but also accompanied by these excessive acts uh, right in our face? Um, so that would be one place I would say. They have an extensive um, uh, a, bit of information and data. Yeah, I think we, there's a lot of writing that Forward Promise has done over the years and tons of different people that we could probably lift up whose work we've, um, we've highlighted in some of our writings. But it just makes me think that we probably um, could create some sort of list or some sort of this is what we're reading this week. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because I'm looking over at the library in my office, like I could give you 25 names right now. Um, but there's a lot on our website, and certainly by looking at the, um, the references in there, you could find things. I'll lift up um, Sean Jenright um, as somebody that we work with a lot around healing-centered approaches and culturally responsive approaches. Um, and his work is really important in terms of um, thinking well about how we engage young people in understanding um, dehumanization and then um, empowering them and igniting them to um, be transformational leaders. That's excellent. Mm -hmm. and I know that we're sharing like a few more resources uh, on the YouTube feed. If you have any more um, suggestions, you can feel free uh, to just add those there. But in the interest of time, I do want to uh, get to our call to action. Uh, we only have a few more minutes left. Uh, but if you have any uh, last minute questions, feel free to drop them in the comments and, and hopefully we can get to it. But um, I just wanna be mindful of everyone's time. So there are a few things that uh, we do want to share uh, on our end. Uh, we encourage you all to watch the I Am Human film on the Forward Promise website. That's at forwardpromise.org. Um, also, as I mentioned earlier, um, and also in the YouTube chat, we have a paper uh, disrupting dehumanization and affirming the humanity of boys and men of color and their villages. Uh, which can also be found on forwardpromise.org. Uh, the paper dives deeper into the dehumani dehumanization framework and solutions that we uh, discussed today. And then also um, you've heard the case for disrupting dehumanization and solutions to combat dehumanization in our communities. So similar to that question that we posed to the panelists, uh, we would like to leave this question with our viewing audience. Uh, what is your commitment to disrupting dehumanization. And uh, if you are ready to answer, you can feel free to drop in the comment section and we'll uh, read a few out loud. Um, but as we are doing that, I do want to uh, recognize the polls uh, that we have completed. And um, I wanted to sh show everyone like <laughs> uh, how you all responded to those. We have a graphic that will be shown up here in, in a moment. And just also thank you again so much for uh, participating uh, in our discussion. So we heard earlier uh, folks that learned about how um, dehumanization is impacting uh, not just our community or your community, but other communities that we saw that we have a lot of folks that said that they learned a lot from that. And then also um, we have folks that are doing a lot of uplifting um, of narrative in their, in their work. 
and uh, also through through policy change and direct service. So thank you for participating in our poll. And uh, as we check out the chat, we want to see what you all are doing to disrupt dehumanization. If you don't have an answer now, we know that you are doing the work. Um, but mm -hmm. the point is to really uh, take what we've learned today and, and try to find ways to uh, channel that in our own day-to-day -day work and also just in our day-to-day -day life. So we really do appreciate um, the time that you spent with us today. Um, yeah, so without uh, further ado, I just want to make a, just a general announcement um, as we get some more uh, responses that we would really appreciate if you took a post-event uh, reflection survey uh, the link is going to appear on the screen momentarily. Uh, this is also just our first of our five webcasts. So um, come out to our next uh, webcast uh, and our next episode is entitled Return Me to Myself, Disrupting the Dehumanization of Our Cultures and Spirits. It's on Tuesday, September 8th, 2020 at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And uh, all, you can watch it through the same channel that uh, you're watching it right now. Um, so thank you all uh, so much. Uh, I really want to just take a moment to thank uh, the folks who organized this, uh, Michelle, um, April, behind the scenes working uh, with us uh, to make sure that this was a, a seamless event. Thank you all so much for your work and for your thoughtfulness. And um, thank you to our panelists, um, each of you, Katrina, Hector, Howard, and Rhonda for, for doing such a lovely uh, job this uh, afternoon. And if we could, um, we have like maybe one or two more minutes, if we could just briefly just say like one more uh, word uh, as we depart for this afternoon. Uh, and we'll start with, with you, Rhonda. Um, I'll just say there, you don't need to feel like you're alone. There are really strong organizations and communities pushing this work already. Check out our website to learn about uh, 16 of them, National Compadres Network being one. And if there's something that interests you, reach out to us and we'll be happy to share more. Thank you. Uh, Katrina, please. I just really appreciated um, this conversation with everyone. I feel like I learned so much and just, mm -hmm. I found it really enjoyable to just prep for it and thinking about our work um, with this dehumanization framework. I've never had to do that before. So just wanna appreciate the panelists and for everyone that participated and listened in today. Thank you, Katrina. Um, Hector? You know, I'm always humble. I'm always humble to be in the presence of these incredible people who are, you know, all the things that I aspire to be. So I'm very thankful. Wonder, um, you know, what, what sacrifices my ancestors made to allow me to be here today, you know, uh, it's really, truly humbling. I would say as a, as a parting comment is I would just, if you work with young people or if you are a young person, to recognize the many dimensions of who you are, that you have the intellect or your mind, that you have your emotional part of you and you have your spiritual part of you. And that uh, when we're really working in synchronicity, all those things fit together and there is no separation. And that when you show up in that way, that you have that ability. And on a personal level, the way that I let it be manifested is I would say that if the children that the people that are on this panel and, and he, you know, Howard has an adult child and, and, a, and a teenager, that if they were to walk in my presence, mm -hmm. that without me saying a thing, that they would recognize that I see them right? Mm -hmm. That would be, that is the gold standard that I strive for. So without saying a word, you know, <laughs> that if they scan the room and we don't make eye contact, that something in my posture, in my sense of being that exudes from who I am, that tells them there's a man that sees me and understands me and is in, in, an, in an ally relationship with me. That, that's, that's what the muscle that I'm working to, 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 to perfect. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Hector. Um, Howard? Beautiful. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure being here. I got some healing, and I would say to everybody, don't let a hunter tell your story. You got to fight for your story. You got to tell your story. 
And uh, if nobody else believes you, you know, you still tell your story. Absolutely. Well, uh, thank you all so much for, for joining us. Uh, have a lovely afternoon and, um, and join us for our next uh, webcast. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you.